The Old Testament scripture today is from the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. You can follow along in the Pew Bibles on pages 17 and 18. After these events, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, Abraham answered, I'm here. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Set, offer him up as an entirely burned offering there on one side of the mountains that I will show you. Abraham got up early in the morning, harnessed his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, together with his son Isaac. He split the wood for the entirely burned offering, set out, and went to the place God had described to him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place at a distance. Abraham said to his servants, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will walk up there, worship, and then come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the entirely burned offering and laid it on his son Isaac. He took the fire and the knife in his hand, and the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, Abraham said, I'm here, my son. Isaac said, here is the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the entirely burned offering? Abraham said, the lamb for the entirely burned offering? God will see to it, my son. The two of them walked on together. They arrived at the place God had described to him. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He tied up his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. But the Lord's messenger called out to Abraham from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham said, I'm here. The messenger said, don't stretch out your hand against the young man and don't do anything to him. I know that you revere God and didn't hold back your son, your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a single ram caught by its horns in the dense underbrush. Abraham went over, took the ram and offered it as an entirely burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham named that place, the Lord sees. That is the reason people today say on this mountain, the Lord is seen. The next scripture reading comes from Paul's letter to the people of Rome, chapter six, verses one through 11. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. <coughs> But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. But death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. But so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this week's Pew to Pulpit question is one that I'm sure you have thought of before, whether it's on a deeply uh, concentrated or thoughtful level, or maybe just a fleeting idea or notion that entered one ear and went out the other. I'm sure some of us at some point have often thought this question. And so the question this week was directly stated to me. My spouse, and I say spouse because I don't want to let someone try to guess who it might be is saying this. I don't even know who it is. 
but I just make it a little general. So my spouse is a non-believer. They always ask why we have to go through a man, Jesus, to get to God. They say that we should be able to go through God straight and not through Jesus first. How can I best explain this to them? Well, this is a little tricky, especially for a non-believer, because I feel a part of it, part of the reasoning is based on a foundation that's a firm in faith. So that will not deter me. I'm still going to try to tackle this very subject and address this today. Uh, so let's attentively listen and see how we can maybe journey through this. So hopefully through today's lesson, we'll discover and learn a little more about God, both Father and Son, Jesus Christ. And maybe too, we'll open our minds and our hearts to see God in a new and different way. And ultimately, maybe it will equip us to best describe and explain this to someone else, as someone who either has faith or maybe struggles with finding that in the first place. And so uh, that is all kind of intertwined and mingled into today's message on do we have to go through Jesus Christ to, in fact, get to God? So there are, of course, a couple of different angles that we could take with this morning's message and this potential predicament. We could discuss the connection between God the Father and Son, Jesus Christ. Or we could look at the traditional viewpoint of God as a hierarchy. We see God the Father at the top and Jesus Christ the Son sitting on the right hand of God the Father. And the Holy Spirit as a welcome mat into God's throne room. A poor Holy Spirit. It doesn't belong there, but that's often where we put it. Uh, they're all equal, and we see them together and functioning. Or maybe we could look at other inhibitors that prevent people from finding a faith, or from believing in God, or having some way to connect to, or get to, or understand God to begin with. So that's where we're starting today's message. We start in the Old Testament. And the notion of getting to God. As in the Old Testament, the thought was that God often resided in heaven. A kind of a realm apart from us. Uh, not of this earth, but a certain separate area where God resided and we couldn't really get to and connect with. And so priests and prophets were sent. A priests were often seen, at, seen as the middleman or the intermediary. Uh, they would be the communicator between the people and with God. Uh, so someone had a concern or they needed to offer the sacrifices to repay their sins, they would go through the priest. There was an area in the temple where the high priest would go and they would be the only one that could make the sacrifice to God, uh, paying for everyone's sins from the past year. And so if someone had a question or concern about God, they would go to the priest. And then the priest in turn would also tell the people what God would tell, talk to them or uh, tell them and the prophets as well of what their expectation was and what they were supposed to do. So sadly, it wasn't like someone could just go to a pay phone, a pick it up and put in a denarii and say, hey, God, how are you doing today? No, it's kind of like those old telephone uh, hubs where you had an operator. You'd call an operator and say, hello, who can I connect you with, please? And then put the little peg in the hole and then connect you with the person on the other line. So that was the Old Testament kind of thought of how one communicates with and connects and gets to and understands God. That person, that priest, that operator in the middle that connected the both sides. So uh, when we had that, that was how we thought God was our connecting piece. But Christ, when Christ arrived, everything all kind of changed. All of that was kind of turned on its head. You see, he taught us different ways that we could pray. He taught us that we could talk to God directly uh, through our own personal being, and God heard us and listened to us. And so as opposed to just a few characters in the Old Testament, which God would speak directly to, like Abraham that we read this morning, or Hagar we talked about last week, that God could speak to all of us. And Christ taught us this. He taught us new ways to live and different ways that we can see that kind of light. And so with listening to this and understanding this, it opened up a whole new avenue of opportunities with, with us and our connectedness to God. So we have that communication route. We have the old one with the Old Testament and needing to go through a priest. I kind of like the pewter pulpit question. We have to go through Christ to get to God. But then we have 
Another thought and understanding of a topic I've been talking about for the past few months on and off, the, the whole Trinity thing. Now since I've spent some whole sermons on it, I'm not going to rehash it or go through exactly every little dot and tittle of it, but essentially for a quick refresher for those who might not have been here, it's one God and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in no particular order or hierarchy or a better or less than type of magnitude, but one God working together in three different ways. And so coming up with ways to express this and understand it are both challenging and difficult at times, I've, I, as I've expressed before. But there's one uh, image that recently came into my understanding in, in light of this that I thought was pretty interesting, so I'll share it with you this morning. Let's see, there's a small group that I'll uh, try to get to when I can that usually meets about every other week, and they study books and go through books. And one of the most recent books has been one by Max Licato, a titled Grace, a More Than We Deserve and Greater Than We Imagine. So those of you that are not familiar with Max Licato, he's a pastor, uh, so he writes a lot of books, and he also has some great sermons that I've listened to and heard before. I really appreciate and love the imagery that he uses. And so this book just so happened to paint a new kind of image to me uh, with the Trinity. He talked about the story of this adulteress getting pulled out of her bedroom early in the morning by the priests and the local authorities of the town. Uh, she was dragged through the streets, kicking and complaining, and they brought her and plopped her at the feet of Jesus Christ. At which point the priests and authorities said, Jesus, now this woman has been caught in adultery. And Moses' law says that we should stone her. At which point Jesus stooped down and began writing in the sand and the dust with his hand. The same hand that was used to gather up the soil in the Garden of Eden to make Adam at Eve. Did you catch that little nuance? The very same hand that was used to create Adam out of the soil in the Garden of Eden was the one that Christ stooped down to write in the sand and say to these people, a you without sin may cast the first stone. At which point everyone kind of turned and walked away with their tail between their legs. So God, one in the same. Jesus Christ, present since the beginning of God, using that hand to gather, gather up the soil and create Adam, and also writes in the dust and the sand here in the town with the alleged adulteress. And so we have this connection and clear understanding that many still believe and uh, rightly assume that God and Christ are one in the same. You see, but what throws us off most times is that Christ was human and Christ was also male. So we wonder, how on earth could God become human? Why would God want to? Why would you want to be like one of us? You're God. You can do whatever you want to. Why would you want to subject yourself to this life and this trial and tribulation, the suffering we occasionally might have to go through? You see, we as humans have weaknesses. We have flaws. We have vulnerabilities, shortcomings, emotions, a finite time period to celebrate and enjoy our life. So that's a long time to spend in one's own skin. And so it's pretty remarkable that God took the time, the effort, and the risk in embarking on this journey and becoming human like one of us. A life that is filled with joys and betrayals, a hungers, pains, a compassion, disappointment, a love, support, danger, excitement, and tiredness. Yes, Jesus Christ is the only one perfect human being to ever grace the face of this earth. But that doesn't mean it was necessarily easy. But we should be grateful for that fact. You see, God walked and lived this challenging, rewarding life right alongside us. They're going through just about everything that we go through, and maybe even more, sometimes in different ways than what we experience. You see, to me, that's what's remarkable about God. But God didn't have to come down here to be with us. Someone didn't say, oh God, you just don't understand us. Send someone down, and so then we'll know. We'll show you how hard this really is. God didn't say, okay, that sounds like a good idea. 
This was God's decision. God said, I'm sending myself, if you want to say that, or my son, Jesus Christ, to differentiate between the persons, to come live and be down here with you, to show you how to live, to show you how to love, to show you how to be a good person and to treat the world with loving kindness and peace. So instead of understanding God as a wizard behind the curtain that we might find in the grand city of Oz, we have someone that we can relate to, someone that we can see and touch and hear, someone that has been just like us in so many different ways. You see, before even knowing Christ, the dilemma of death was one known that was to be permanent. But Christ again changed all of that. By being here and through Christ's sacrifice, we have now have the gift of conquering death and the gift of life eternal. You see, it took the one perfect human being to blot out all of humanity's imperfections that are found in so many people and in fact everyone that's not named Jesus Christ in the world. So now, for those of you that are hearing this, you might think to yourself of a familiar passage and there there is a little monkey wrench that might be kind of thrown into this whole argument that we've built and kind of carried about not having to go through Jesus Christ to get to God. But you may be thinking, well, there's something I read that really doesn't equate to what you're saying here, Pastor Chris. I hear your concerns. I can read your minds. That's right. I knew you guys were going to ask this before I even started preaching today. So there's this uh, section in, chap in John, chapters 13 and 14. Where Christ is meeting with and talking with his disciples. And he says, now one of you will betray me. That, of course, will be Judas. And he says, one also will deny me. And that one, of course, being Simon Peter. So eventually, too, Christ gets to the point that he asserts that they, the, the disciples, should not be troubled. But they must trust in God. And trust also in him. They say, Christ says, his father's house has many rooms to spare. So he mentions how he's going ahead of them to prepare a place for them. And don't worry, I'm going there and I'll make it ready for you and we'll all be okay. And you guys know in which place it is that I'm going. And so in due course, one of the disciples pipes up, his name being Thomas, a later lovingly referred to as Doubting Thomas, and says, uh, Jesus... Or, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Now, how can we possibly know the way? To which Jesus Christ answers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through me. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> what, what did he just say? Je Jesus, did you really say that? He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father except through me. Well, there goes my whole argument. Maybe I should just read that scripture verse and call it a day today, right? But, wait. As I encourage anyone to do when you're reading the Bible, uh, keep reading on. Read a little bit more than what you just read from one verse or two verses. Try to see the whole picture. So if we were to stop there, we would say, well, Jesus says we have to get through Jesus Christ to get to God. But listen to what he says uh, just a few verses later. See, immediately following that statement of being the way, the truth, and the life, from Christ we hear, if you have really known me, you will also know the Father. So from now on, you know him and have seen him. Which then prompts Philip to request, Lord, just show us the Father, and that will be enough. And that's followed by what I imagine to be a very big sigh, although that's not biblical, coming from Jesus Christ. Saying, oh, Peter, don't you know me, Philip? But even after I've been with you all this time, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I've spoken to you, I don't speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me uh, does his work. So trust me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is me. Or at least believe on the account 
of the works themselves. And so there we have it. If we were in fact to stop where Christ said, no one gets to the Father except through me, then we might be able to claim that we have to go through Christ to get to the Father. But Christ clearly tells us in this latter part of John that that's not the case. He and the Father are one in the same. That Christ is the way, that Christ is the truth, that Christ is the life. That He is the way because both He and the Father work in unison. That He is the way because His, God, His words are God's words. And His actions are God's actions. That He is the way because He shows us how to live. At the beginning, He has given us life from the Garden of Eden. And He has also absolved the alleged adulteress from her sin. And shown that she is forgiven and you are to forgive one another. A saying that we hear from both throughout the entirety of Scripture. And so, them being one of, yet not exactly the same, can again be challenging for us to understand. Now, this is a hard enough concept for believers, let alone those people that might not believe or have never heard the name of Jesus Christ before in their life. And especially those that don't want anything to do with God or organize religion as a whole. And so in the end, this sermon might not be exactly the most convincing piece of material to give someone and show how they can exactly get to God without having to go through Jesus Christ. Although Christ opens up many more opportunities and understandings and ways for us to understand God. But maybe it can at least open our minds and our hearts to see ways in which we can get to God differently. Some of us, maybe God communicates to us during our dreams. Maybe it's through other people. Maybe it's through the church that we belong to, the community that we live in, or the world, or the nation that we're a part of. You see, God speaks to people in so many different ways. Again, we have to be attentive and listening and have our eyes, our ears, and everything else, and our hearts and minds open to see exactly how Jesus Christ and God are one and the same and how they work together. But so while I get that it may be challenging to, to decipher and understand and process, um, I'm going to try to offer up a small little snippet or nugget uh, closing in which we could maybe explain this to someone. Again, in my words, and if you have this dilemma or this situation, maybe you can come up with something else on your own. But here's what I would kind of suggest or just want to say uh, if I had a spouse that was in that boat of not believing. Say, honey, I know the common belief is that in order to have a connection to God, we must go through Jesus Christ. But trust me when I tell you that God hears your concerns. That God still listens and desires deeply for you to be connected with Him. See, this can happen in a number of different ways and along a variety of paths. And know that if you ever get to Christ, instead of focusing on the fact that He was human, and he was male, but focus instead on the fact that he is God. He was this gift that we have been given. A gift that was innocent, loving, and sweet for us to enjoy, and to appreciate, and to love. It wasn't meant to be a blockade for, to prevent us from getting to God. It was more or less meant to be a gate that opens and says, come, follow me. Through me, you can know more about God. Through me, you can find God. I can help you get there. I won't prevent you from getting there and turn you away. I may be the way, the truth, and the life. But my way, my truth, my life all leads to God. To come, to join me. And let's see what we can find together. Amen.